Well, it is good to be here this afternoon. I have enjoyed, I can't speak for anyone else, but I have enjoyed this day. It is a great day to come together and to, to study, uh, again, such an important uh, topic. And I hope that you have been as edified as I have been today. And I want to say thank you to each of the speakers who have spoken thus far. And, and I am so appreciative for the lessons you have prepared and, and how thoughtful uh, they are and, and well presented. And, and what a blessing it is. I must say very quickly that I remember a few years ago at the lectureship uh, getting up and I would time after time say something to the effect that you had 38 minutes, 35 minutes, whatever we were giving. And then I got up, I think I was doing the last lesson that year, and I got up and uh, Galen McCorkle, uh, who was with the congregation at that time, uh, spouted off as I got up and told me I had 38 minutes. So it was, it was quite... Uh, hilarious that, that they got me, but I was telling Olivia, I've got to make sure I try to keep within the 35 minute range there, and so I will do my best to do so, because it's not very fair to tell you guys, you only have 35 minutes, then I take the 60 minutes, so you will bow with me as we go to God in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, we humbly bow before you in prayer and praise you, exalt you, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity we've had today to study your word. Father, we thank you for your word that guides us. We thank you for the opportunity to study uh, your church, uh, study the first century church and, and how it relates to us, study these various subjects. We pray that we have been, will be true to eat to what your word teaches on these things. We pray that you will help us to uh, grow a knowledge of, of your will on these matters and again apply them to our lives and live accordingly and that we may share them with others that they may come to know you uh, and do what is right in your sight before it is everlasting too late. We pray these things humbly in Christ's most precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. The theme of the series today has been an examination of the first century church. And what a wonderful series it has been, as I've already uh, stated I have been edified by these things, and I, I hope and pray that each of you have. And there's so much that we have seen. I know we have the, the, the six topics that we have looked at, and of course we have the songs that we have sung that, as we remember, Colossians 3 and verse 16, that we are teaching and admonishing one another in. But there are so many things, so many different, uh, getting back to that panorama view, there are so many angles that we are getting at, so many things that we uh, need to look at and, and understand and make sure that we are uh, in compliance with, with what God's Word tells us. Just think about a few of these things that, that we have noted today. That there is one church, Ephesians 4 and verse 4, chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, that it was established by Christ, Matthew 16 verses 18 and 19, belongs to Christ, Acts 20, and verse 28, which he purchased, of course, with his, his blood. We have studied the growth of the first century church, a, a wonderful lesson by Brother Max, and, and going through, uh, just read the book of Acts and, and see the growth of that early, uh, the first century church. We have seen some right, and indeed some wrong, attitudes some right and indeed some wrong behaviors uh, among the church uh, of the first century. We don't look back. We often are, are accused by those in the denominational world of trying to go back and be like them. And Well, they weren't perfect. Well, no, they weren't perfect. We don't look to the people who, who were doing error. We don't want to follow them any more than we want to follow those who are doing error today. But we do look back to the church as it was established by Christ, as it was set forth in the Word of God, that it ought to be, and that is what we ought to strive to be. Often we are asked, and you've probably over the years been asked, well, what are you talking about what 
denomination are you and all. And, and I have come to, to express the answer to that is I'm simply a Christian. That's all I am, all I want to be. And that's what we all ought to uh, desire. This afternoon's theme that we will be looking at at this time is, of course, worship. And brothers and sisters, I must admit there's a great deal of things that we can look at, and I know that the congregation here, and I'm sure the congregations that are represented, that we have all looked at this subject at various times in, in various ways and seen many things, and we might get to what I uh, have decided to, to refer to it as the four and five, the four types of worship, and the five acts of worship. And we'll, if, you're, if you're sitting here thinking about, well, what are the four types of worship, and well, I think I know the five acts of worship, don't worry, we're going to get into some of that as we go through there. But we, we look at those things, and maybe we, we think, well, that's all that can be said about worship. I, I submit to you, if we did nothing but turned over to the book of Psalms and, and read through the various Psalms, we would get a beautiful understanding of worship. Now, no, I don't go to the Psalms. I know that some people will look at Psalm 150 and talk about, well, there's the... the Mechanical instruments there, and so it must be okay. Of course, we know that the Psalms also talks about animal sacrifices. We're not using those. Uh, so we don't go over to the book of Psalms to, in fact, learn the various things we are supposed to do, but it does, as we can see in a number, and we will see in a number of, of Psalms, it does teach us about worship. And it is a very great uh, benefit. The... Uh, First century church, and we can say that it is true, as, as I've already alluded to, that they had their strengths. They had their weaknesses. This, of course, is true when it comes to worship. As we will see, there, are, uh, there were right conduct, uh, right attitudes, right behavior in, in the first century uh, church, just like there, are, there is now. And there was wrong behavior conduct, attitudes. I want us to look today in the lesson at, at some various things, seeing the simplicity, the beauty, the accuracy, and yes, some failings in the first century uh, brother, and in comparison in ourselves as well. I'm not saying necessarily here in this congregation or the congregations represented, but in the, the Lord's church today, we see these, many of these same problems we are going to look at the subject or the object. I, I was debating, uh, English minor here, and I was debating, well, is it the subject or the object? And, and truly, we will see that our subject, our object of worship is both of those things. He is our subject. He is our object of worship. We're going to be looking at the purposes of worship and then the proper ways of worship. And it is important to, to look at that. When we stop and we think about worship, we, there is much that could be said, and indeed there is much misunderstanding. We often think, if I say worship, what do we think? We think of the corporate worship, of coming together. Brothers and sisters, if I, if I say, and I do say, that, that you don't have to be, and be careful before you're ready to put me in a noose or anything about this, but you don't have to come to this building, you don't have to come here with the brethren in order to worship God. Now, I'm not saying we don't have an obligation to be here. I'm not saying we don't have an obligation to come together. Indeed, the Word of God does teach us that we come together to do so. Uh, again, I, I alluded to Colossians 3 and verse 16 where we teach and admonish one another, clearly talking about worshiping the Lord. Obviously, there is a, an aspect there where we come together and we worship. As was mentioned earlier, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, specifically 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves. We see that that is true, but stop and consider there in Acts chapter 16. Remember about Paul and Silas? They were beaten. They were thrown into prison. And about midnight, what did they do? They sang praises unto God. So they weren't sitting in the church building. They weren't sitting 
uh, among, now they were there with each other, so they, they were brethren of like faith, but, but they weren't out here in some large congregation or such, and they were still worshiping God. And it, and it, is, it is an important, sub, important fact to understand that, that that is the case. I want us to turn over to the book of Psalms. I want you to notice, and we're not going to go through all that we could on, on these things, but I do want us to look at, at just a few of the, the psalms that, that I had jotted down and, and looked at it and, and notice, indeed, in these, the simplicity, the beauty of, of worship, the accuracy of worship. We start with Psalm 18. And verse 3. Psalm 18 and verse 3. Where the psalmist here writes, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. You can read the same thing in, in 2 Samuel 22. And verse 4, by the way. Psalm 24 and verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein getting to the heart of, or, or at least a portion of, of why we worship God. Psalm 29, verse, verses 1 and following. Given to the Lord, O ye mighty, given to the Lord glory and strength. Given to the Lord the glory due unto His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. It goes on, of course, from there. Psalm 30 and verse 1. I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up and hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. And we could go on and on and on. 31 and verse 1. And, and so many different texts within the Psalms. I encourage you, and I often encourage the congregation here, read the book of Psalms. Olivia and I were reading... Uh, this book just recently, and now we've gotten into Proverbs, and we're almost through with Proverbs and reading that, and, and there's a, a world of difference in reading the style of the Psalms, which is Hebrew poetry, and the beauty that is found there, and getting over into Proverbs, the wisdom. Both are, are very important things to study and, and things we need to know, we understand. But, but when it comes to worshiping God, when it comes to prayers, I often say this, that when it comes to prayers, read the Psalms. If these can't help you in your prayer life, I don't know what can. These things bring out that important uh, fact of, of uh, properly worshiping and, and, of course, praying uh, to God. So we see uh, in, in these things the, the simplicity and the beauty of it. And, and we may ask, well, why is it so simple about worship? In fact, we, we look and we see that man, man is corrupted. Man has, in fact, uh, caused great complications in worship, has he not? Just stop and look at, at, at worship and and in today's society and, and over the years and how man is always trying to complicate things. I, I've told the congregation here on a number of occasions that I know someone that I, I cherish very dearly, a, a very important person to me, uh, someone I love very much, who is not a member of the Lord's Church, who has expressed in, in relationship to, to worship and re specifically in the use of the mechanical instrument, but it sounds so Pretty. Now, I don't dispute that statement. It does sound pretty. I, as someone who was in band for years, play, plays the trumpet, I think mechanical instruments sound beautiful. And it still doesn't change the point that God didn't tell us to use them in worship. That He does not authorize us to use them in worship. So, when we start looking at these things, we see the, the, the complication that man makes of it. Now I know here in, in the book of Acts chapter 17, we read of, of an interesting event beginning with verse 16. We read there, of course, where Paul, he, 
He's, we're told here in verses 16 and following, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. And he goes on and of course he comes upon, and what an interesting event here. He comes upon these idols. And, and you remember here in verse, verses 22 and following, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious, the King James Version says. I, I like looking up the Greek. I know not everybody does, but I looked up the Greek for uh, this, and I'm probably going to mispronounce the Greek, but excuse me for that. Desidemon, uh, or daemon, or however you pronounce it, which means basically very religious. They were very religious. And we might think, well, that's a good thing, isn't it? They were religious, but they were religious in an inaccurate way. And of course, we continue in verse 23, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, and devotions there is sebasma, which means object of worship. Some translate as a place of worship, sanctuary. Uh, you might find that, what you in fact find the same word used in 2 Thessalonians 2.4 for worship. Uh, but, but we see here that, that Paul comes by and he, he beheld their devotions I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. They had altars and, and idols, and they were worshiping all these different gods, and they just wanted to cover their bases and make sure they didn't leave anybody out. So they here this is complicated. Complications, isn't it? Uh, looking at, at, at things in an un, inappropriate uh, manner. And this is certainly nothing new for uh, mankind at this time. Uh, we could go back and study in the Old Testament and see idolatry uh, and how the, the Jews of, of the Old Testament, that how they fell away into idolatry. And of course, there in Egypt, the Egyptians were idolatrous and had all sorts of false gods and, and such. So, so this is nothing new. But he, he goes on here in verse 23, Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. They were worshiping the unknown God. They were doing it ignorantly. They were doing it inappropriately. And we need to, to understand that. And man complicates it. But God has made it so simple. You know, it's interesting. I read, was reading and studying here in Acts 17 last night. And, and I was talking to Olivia and it's amazing. The more I read this text, the more amazed I am at how much God gives us in this, in this instance. Yes, Paul was talking about God. He was talking about, uh, of course, uh, idolatry, refuting idolatry. But did you know he refutes racism here? It was mentioned about racism in the Roman church. He refutes racism in, in this text that we are all made of one blood. Brothers and sisters, I told Olivia this last night, that, that should end any issues with race. Right there. Uh, and we may look different. We may have different colors of, of pigment, as, as Olivia was pointing out, different colors of pigment in our skin. But we are all of the same blood. We all came from two couples. Adam and Eve, Noah and his wife. Now, obviously they, all, they had three sons, so we didn't come from all three sons. But we came from those two couples. Every one of us, no matter what our background is. And, and we need to understand that. But before I get off on this, uh, on, on that subject too much, he also in here talks about it in discussing who God is. He talks about how that God put within us a, a desire, I will say, a desire to seek after Him, to, to, to believe in Him. There are those, and I, I've met people who profess to be atheists. Brothers and sisters, that's a choice they make. 
Because God put it within all of us to, to understand there is someone there. There is someone higher than who we are. There is a God and, and that we ought to seek after Him. And, and so when we talk about the simplicity of, of how God has, has brought forth these things, we need to understand that he, it is simple because we have this. You see, the, the error that we find in, in any subject for that matter, but when we talk about worship, the error we find, the complications we find in, in worship are found because man is not looking to this and not abiding in the Word of God. He starts deciding, I'll do it my way. The old Frank Sinatra song, you remember it? I did it my way. Well, you may like Frank singing, or you may not, I don't know, but... It's not about doing it my way. And yet that's what many in the religious world is doing. And, and too many, even in the Lord's church, go off into it because they like this way. They like that way. It must be okay uh, on the mechanical instrument. It must be okay. And, and I like it. It sounds so pretty. Or, or you know, we, we look at, at these, these various uh, aspects. You know, I... I I just can't see telling a woman that she can't lead in the, the worship service because she has talents. And after all, she's a better speaker than this old fellow we got up here now. So surely she can do that. Brothers and sisters, she may be ten times better the speaker than he is. She may be ten times more knowledgeable than he is. And she still doesn't have that authority. And we need to understand that. It doesn't matter when it comes to it, uh, looking at it from our own perspective, just like... We think about King Saul. King Saul was taller from the shoulder than anybody else. He was much to be looked at. And here David, this who, who apparently looked all right, he's a handsome fellow apparently from what they, they were saying, but, but here this little ruddy uh, shepherd boy basically, not much to look at. God looked at what mattered. He looked at his heart. And so we need to, to see indeed in these, these texts the, the beauty and the, the simplicity of, of uh, worshiping God. I want us to spend some time looking at the, the subject, the object of, our, of, of theirs and, and indeed our worship. And of course we've already pointed out, and if you haven't got that subject yet, if you haven't got that point yet, then you haven't been listening very well because our, our object of worship, our subject of worship, is God. Brothers and sisters, uh, it was mentioned in one of the sermons earlier about preacher eyes and, and how we sometimes get that way. And I must admit, I have preachers I like to listen to and I, I've had preachers over the years that I just don't get. And now, I, I've said before that I, I've known preachers that they can just, they can get up and they can present a, and, and I know it's a, a what, I could name a name here, I won't, but I could name a name of a preacher that you all know, or I'm pretty sure you would all know, and just does a wonderful job, a very knowledgeable, very capable uh, preacher, I'm guessing far more knowledgeable about the Word of God than I am, far more capable than I am. And yet I struggle sitting and listening to this preacher because I just don't get the way that he expresses. Now that's me, brothers and sisters. That's not him, that's me. I'm somehow not getting it. We need to recognize something. We may get off in these things. And we think about the, the subject, who we direct our worship to. And, and there are many people, it, it's not about the preacher. Brothers and sisters, if I'm standing up here and I'm preaching, or one of the other men stands up here and preaches, and you are here worshiping him or worshiping me, you need to change things. I don't want your worship. I'm not here to be worshipped. And, and I don't expect anybody here is trying to worship me, but I, I just assure you, I'm not here, in fact, to be worshipped. And, and we should not uh, 
desire to do that. The, as we read in the very Psalms we looked at, it is God whom we worship. God is worthy to be praised. As we noted in, in the 18th Psalm in verse 3, God is worthy. He is the one that we come together and worship. I want to spend, and I know we, we, we didn't go into great detail on that. We, we don't have a huge amount of time left, but I want to cover some more things here. The purposes of worship. Now one might say, well now Robert, wait a minute. God is the, the object of our worship. He is the one we worship, so how can there be purposes of worship? There are, and there's more than what we're going to cover, but I want to make it very simple here in, in, in looking at, at these, this point. As we've already pointed out, as we've already looked at, our, our obviously the one we are worshiping, the one we are praising, uh, the very purpose of our coming together or wherever we might be in, in our in worshiping, that we are worshiping God. We are uplifting Him, extolling Him as we mentioned earlier. That is clearly the purpose and, and nothing else I say takes away from that point. But I also alluded, pointed to, Colossians 3 and verse 16. Colossians 3 and verse 16, Paul wrote, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Brothers and sisters, when we come together, we come together to worship God. I understand that. I don't come to worship you. You don't come to worship me. But we do come as a part of our worship. It is to teach and to admonish one another. This is an aspect of what we are doing when we come together and we worship. When we study His Word, when we learn His Word, we are in fact teaching and admonishing. We are edifying 2 Thessalonians 5 and verse 11, an obligation that we are to do, uh, that we are to edify one another. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Now, I want to say, brothers and sisters, we don't have to uh, look at this and, and say, well, okay, well, are you saying we only do that when we worship? Are you only doing that when you are here to worship? No, we don't. And we, and we shouldn't. But, brothers and sisters, we do come together when, when we worship and we are doing these things. Again, that is not to say that in any of those things that we are worshiping one another, that we are praising one another, we should not do so. Sometimes we get into the habit of, of praising ourselves or praising the preacher or praising this one or praising that one and, and we aren't to do that. I want to look a little bit at the proper ways of worship. I mentioned earlier in the lesson the four and the five. The four types of worship, if you will. And the five acts of worship. Now, I'm guessing most, if not all in here, know, in fact, the five quote-unquote acts of worship. How many of us know the four types of worship? I'm guessing all the preachers are probably sitting here saying, oh, I got them. I know these. And many in the congregation are probably saying, yeah, we know that. Four types of worship. We have, of course, Acts 15, or excuse me, Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9. Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9. Jesus here speaking would say, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Ever see that? Ever hear that? 
I, I, I've mentioned to the congregation on a number of occasions, and I'm sure you've all heard these things before. Uh, you've met people probably who do that, who, who draw close to God with their mouth. But their heart's far from God. I don't know how many times I've heard individuals who have praised God, and He, he is so good to me, and it's good to acknowledge God, and, it, it, and I don't take away from that, but He's so wonderful that you watch their life, you listen to the way they speak, the way they act, and you can just tell from their language, from their behavior, that their heart is far from God when it comes to worshiping God, that they, they are doing it their way. They are striving to, to worship Him in the manner that, that pleases them, that, that makes them happy. And brothers and sisters, in vain, they're worshiping God. Useless is what it comes down to. They are, is uselessly a word? It's useless. It, it, it's to no end, as Strong's points out. To no end. They're not achieving anything by worshiping God in an inappropriate manner. They, they are, they are, uh, not pleasing God, we understand. We see will worship in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 23. Colossians 2 and verse 23, where Paul here writes, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in all in will worship and humility and neglecting of, of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Gnostics. Had a problem. You back up to verse 21. Touch not, taste not, handle not. This idea of depriving the flesh. I'll go out and live in a cave and I'll starve myself and I'll not dress very well and I'll, I'll just do all this and somehow it'll draw, I'll draw closer to God. What about today? Now there's an advertisement for Burlington. Have you seen it? Where these this family is at Burlington, and I think it's Burlington, and they're buying these clothes, and and they're talking about it's coming up on Easter, so they're getting these Easter, and they dress up, and the little girl says, and we go to church. Does that does that not express a lot of people's thoughts? It's Easter. We're going to church, brothers and sisters. I don't tell anyone they shouldn't go to church on any occasion that they have the opportunity if they are going. And doing what God has said. But let me let me tell you, if the only time you darken the doors is on Easter, and I suppose Christmas is the other day, you got a problem. There, there's a problem. You're, 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 you're worshiping God according to what pleases you. You know, back to back to what I, I told you a few minutes ago about the individual I know and, and the beauty of the, the instrumental music. It's so pretty to hear. That's me. That's what pleases me. And that's will worship. And by the way, these first three are all tied in together. Because if you're worshiping willfully, then you're vainly worshiping God. It's of no, no use, no value. We've already read, of course, and so I'll not read again Acts chapter 17. And, and in, in uh, his discussion there on Mars Hill... Uh, Paul talks about uh, ignorant worship. And, and isn't it interesting? Here Paul is uh, talking to them and, and this preacher of, of the Word of God. And, and what does he do? He calls them ignorant. Don't you ever want to just look at people and say, you bunch of ignorant folks. Of course, people get upset about that. But, but we're all ignorant about something. But he is correcting them and teaching them what they need to know. And... and Certainly, we need to understand it's not a sin to be ignorant as long as we are willing to seek out and learn. The sin is when we aren't wanting to learn, when we're not willing to learn. Well, what if these folks, if Paul tells them this and their attitude is, well, I don't care. I don't to worry about that. Then they're willfully remaining in that, that ignorance. But we see, of course, uh, these three are, are, are tied in Together. Then, of course, as uh, we was already alluded to earlier in one of the lessons, John chapter 4 and verse 24. True worship, brothers and sisters. 
based upon spirit or attitude, attitude there, Don, and truth. It matters about our attitude. It matters about doing the truth. And we need to do each of these. And then, of course, the Bible does lay out exactly what we need to do. That, that was the four. Now we look at the five and, and the five acts of worship. We know those five acts, don't we? We, we come together upon the first day, first day of the week and we have prayer and we have songs and we have the Lord's Supper and giving. And, of course, there's a lesson presented and, and learn. As I've said a number of times, if, if the teaching is the only aspect of worship, brothers and sisters, when it comes to the lesson being presented, guess who's the only one worshiping? Me. Now we teach and admonish in our singing, so we're all teaching at that point, but, but we are learning God's Word. That reciprocal relationship, and, and in doing so, we are learning more about what pleases God and, and doing His will. And we, we can see, and, and time's about up here, so, so I'll not go into great detail on these, but I want you to, I want to share with you something I have shared with the congregation here on a number of occasions. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. In discussing the issue of, of giving, 2 Corinthians 8, 2 Corinthians 9, Paul discusses in these texts, among others, the subject of giving. I once alluded to, to the problem of, of giving. There, there's a problem. People don't like to hear about that, the subject of giving. But if you read verse 5, I've often said about giving that if you get this one, then you wouldn't have a problem with the giving. But that's true about anything. You, you want to look at a problem in giving. You want to look at a problem in, in worshiping God in, the, in any aspect, in any manner of the way that He sets forth for us to, to worship. If you want to look at being obedient to Him in, in obeying the gospel, if you want to look at any of these problems, brothers and sisters, right here is the solution in any of them. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Brothers and sisters, show me a problem with someone giving and I'll show you someone who hasn't given himself to the Lord. Show me a problem in, in someone's willingness to, to show up and not forsake the assembling and I'll show you someone who has not given himself or herself, ladies, I don't want to leave you out here, to the Lord. Give me, give, show me a problem with, with someone wanting to go out, talking about growth, wanting to go out and share the good news with others. I'll show you someone who hasn't given himself to the Lord. Any of these things, when it comes down to it, if we would just simply give ourselves to the Lord, talking about commitment that was talked about earlier, if we would just give ourselves to the Lord as we ought to, we wouldn't have a problem with these things, would we? Oh, we might stumble, we might fall, we all do that, but we would not have a problem in correcting that view. Think about David. David goes and cheats with Bathsheba, something he shouldn't have done. Nathan goes to him, tells him this story. He's so angry, he's ready to kill this person. But I'll put him to death. And then those faithful, faithful words, Thou art the man, David. What was David's attitude after that? He was a man after God's own heart, wasn't he? He was willing to correct as best he could what he had done wrong. Brothers and sisters, worship. And we, there's much we didn't cover that I know we know. You know that we didn't really di dig into as deeply as we could. But I wanted us to look in, in this lesson kind of broadly at some of these things and understand that, that worship is crucial. And, and there are those, those facts, if you will, but it, it comes back to, to our heart and, and our heart and, and where our heart is and where our, our, our interest is and, and our commitment is. And, and, and we go through and we look at these, these various lessons. And I would encourage you to to go back, they are in the process of being put on the internet. They will all be put on the internet. Uh, and, and I would encourage you to go back and look at those. Watch them. We, we can provide you copies of them if, you, if you'd like. 
Go back and listen to them. Study them more in depth. Look at the things that weren't covered because I can assure you that each of the speakers could give you other information. But look at these things. Study them and see and make sure that you and I, that we are doing as God would have us to do. The first century church is not perfect because it was made up of people just like you and I. And we're not perfect. But as the Lord established it, as He designed it, it is perfect. It is perfect, brothers and sisters. Think about there in Ephesians chapter 5, and the description, and how Paul talks about using the illustration of the husband and the wife, and beauty that he portrays in the church. Think about that. Are we striving to be what Christ, what He set forth, what He established? If we want to be pleasing to Him, if we want to ultimately get to heaven, we better be. And I hope that that's what you were doing. Uh, you know, we didn't really get into, and, and I do want to kind of add this. Uh, Don, your, your name, I started to call you Paul, but... Don, of course, talking about the various churches, talked about the Corinthians. You can see some error in them. Go over and study 1 Corinthians 11. And, and the problem they had with the Lord's Supper, they were corrupting it. They were, they were bringing, I, I submit to you, that they were bringing uh, a meal and trying to combine the two. And having that meal uh, tied in with the Lord's Supper, which was missing the very point of what the Lord's Supper was, but they were, there was a corruption of it, and, and they needed to correct that. So they weren't perfect, but they did need to correct that. Brothers and sisters, I hope the lesson was informative. I hope that you, you have, and will look at these things. See for yourself what the Word says. And as always, if I ever get up here, and, and I sure, I'm sure that other men will say this, if I ever get up here and you hear me say something, you look at the Word and you say, that's not what the Word says. You believe the Word. You look at the Word and you say, well, here's what the... And let me know. Say, hey, Robert, wait a minute. You need to look at this. And let us each always do that. We want to give you the opportunity that if you're here and you've never obeyed the gospel, that you have the opportunity to do so before you leave this building. Brothers and sisters, friends, there's no reason that anyone should walk out those doors unprepared to meet God. If you've never obeyed the gospel, the Bible lays out what one must do, how we must hear the word, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repent of our own individual sins, confess Him to be the Son of God, and be baptized, immersed in water for the remission of our sins. If you're here and you've never done so, then I would encourage you to do so. But if you're here and you're a Christian, but you, you haven't been what you need to be, if you've heard anything today that, that you say, you know, I need to correct that, He's promised if we're faithful to confess our faults, He's faithful to forgive us. It may be a private matter. Go to God. Seek His forgiveness. He's promised to do so. But it may be something you, you know isn't private. You need to correct it. Or maybe you just need the prayers of your brothers and sisters. Whatever the case may be, if you're here and have need, please come while we stand. I'm always saying. Why, through his word, he called.